It's nice to see you. Thank you for waiting in line. I know you guys have been waiting in line for quite a while. Uh, but you made it in. You win. You're dressed like a TARDIS. I support that. Uh, <laughs> uh, we'd like to get inside you. All right. Um, listen. All right, come on. Let it go, guys. Let it go. Let it go. Uh, well, I would like to introduce you to the reason that you came out today to Wizard World Chicago. Please welcome to the stage Mr. Patrick Stewart and Daniel Stewart. Um, 
The war, as some of you may remember, for a period of time wore a visor, as it was called. Well, you couldn't see his eyes. And back in the old days when Lavar used to sit at Ops, I think it was Ops, um, they had these curved chairs and you could sit back, and this is how people sat. So we started a scene, action, we began the scene, and it came to Lavar's line and there was silence. <laughs> Someone else said the last line for him, and he slept unknowingly. <laughs> <laughs> you talk about dancing, but you had some pretty sweet dance. What, what, what was, how did the Alphabet song video come to be? Have you seen that? Have you seen that line? You mean, oh, when you're on the bridge and you're singing the Alphabet? You're a girl. Yes. Well, you know, that was a private gift. The internet is full of those. Yeah. <laughs> for Gene Longbury, for his birthday, um, my wife, Dan's mother, was, uh, is a choreographer, terrific choreographer, and she came in uh, one afternoon during lunch break and she choreographed that whole number. Uh, have you seen this? Yeah. And, uh, and I sang it as a gift for uh, Gene Longbury, and we presented him with the tape. Then some idiot went and put piano accompaniment on it <laughs> in a different key from the key I was singing. On. <laughs> but of course, nobody thinks the pianist is in the wrong key, they think it's me. <laughs> um, so if you have it, turn the sound, well, you can't turn the sound off, then you don't hear me singing the piano. Um, yeah, well, you know, I had excellent choreography, that's why. And that's why Dan is such a good dancer, because his mother was a cargo. Dan, you, you got to do a certain episode. I did. Was it, was it fun? Was it, was it, was it, was it was terrifying? It was yeah. terrifying, actually. Because uh, I was only about a year out of drama school and had never actually been on camera before. I like to think that it doesn't show, but I'm not sure. Um, and on top of that, it, you know, there's, there's a lot of responsibility that comes with being on that show. It really is. And, uh, it's a huge honor, and you want to be able to, to be good. But uh, having grown up with all those guys, I mean, not just Brent and Labar and Jonathan and the gang, but also the crew, because as Dad says, they were, they were there every day for seven years, and they were a pretty amazing bunch of guys. So you couldn't have had a more supportive environment to do your first TV job. It was incredible. Do you, because you both obviously have huge theater backgrounds, and you, do you actually leave the Royal Shakespeare Company to go shoot Star Trek? Not the Royal Shakespeare Company, no. Um, what happened was I had, in fact, uh, after something like 14 years of working steadily with the company, I had left to try to get some TV and film, uh, and it wasn't going too well. And then I got offered a job at the National Theatre, the Royal National Theatre in London, the only time they've ever offered me a job. I did that job. And I had um, a break in it, and I went to do some lecturing and teaching in Southern California and stayed with a friend of mine uh, who was a, an English professor at UCLA. And um, one night he said, look, uh, do me a favor, I'm giving a public lecture campus in Royce Hall, and I asked a friend of mine, an actress, would you two of you come in and illustrate the lecture by reading extracts from the plays I'm talking about? And he said, there's a hundred dollars in the talk. <laughs> <laughs> sweet. <laughs> Very sweet. <laughs> and uh, I did that, and of course, unknown to me, she signed up for the course of public lectures with a man called Robert Justman, who was not only one of the original producers of the original classic Star Trek, but had been brought in to help launch this new version of Star Trek. And he claims that he's an honest man, I think, that halfway through this evening, he turned to his wife and said, we found the captain. <laughs> it took six months and three, four auditions and meetings. I met Gene Roddenberry the next morning. They called up right away, and I went to see Gene in his little house up in the Hollywood Hills. Um, I remember a lot of orange shag pile carpet. <laughs> um, that went in a year or so. 
Uh, and uh, he, although he was very civil, he said after I had left, absolutely no way. This is not the man I want to have in my Really? Oh, yeah, yeah. Why? What was his reason? Uh, a bald, middle-aged English Shakespearean. <laughs> <laughs> between sci-fi fantasy and Shakespeare. I mean, it's like, it's this kind of like melodramatic, almost like social allegory. I, I don't know, I, I, it makes perfect sense to me. Yeah, it, it made sense to me, too. How <laughs> <laughs> did you win him over? I, I mean, I, I didn't, I had nothing to do with it at all. Um, he was, I'm told, gradually worn down by Robert Justman and the casting department, the, the wonderful um, Junie Lowry. Juni Lowry, whose name you will see everywhere, great, Great casting director and cast, I think, every episode of Star Trek, actually. Um, and when he came on board, because he was not on board at the beginning, the man who became the executive producer for Star Trek, uh, Rick Burke. And Rick became a great champion of mine, so he joined with Robert Justman. And I think they just wore deep down. So he cast me just to shut them on. <laughs> Well, as I said to you backstage, I've, I've, been, I've been friends with Will Wheaton since he was doing Star Trek, and he sends his love to you uh, in, in, in a very non threatening way. And uh, <laughs> it's all hugs. And, but but Will, Will, said, Will said at one time, I didn't realize how, like, it, he told me that you were, you were hilarious. And I've seen that over the years since then, but at the time we were teenagers, I was like, really? Patrick Stewart's hilarious? And he, said, he told me the story where you guys were on the bridge and you would say stuff like, uh, Edson Crusher set a course for Rigel Three, and in Grecian times, a, young, a general would take a young boy out on campaign. <laughs> Um, and uh, I said, it's, 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 it's got to stop. 
you know, we, we, you, what you don't understand why you're fooling around that there are people here who are here 12 hours a day and they can't fool around. If they were fool around, you'd get angry with them. No, we have got to be much more serious and get through the work. And they're all looking at me like, who is this guy? <laughs> and I remember Denise Crosby, of course, who didn't stay in the series for long, saying, but Patrick, you know, we've got to have some fun. And I said, you are not here to have fun. And then go over. So, uh, not well. I think they just, they may just have laughed. Anyway, the fact of the matter is that during that first season, and certainly the second season, I discovered for the first time in my life it was possible to work very hard, do the best work you could, and have fun at the same time. And those guys, Jonathan Brandt, Lavar, Michael, Gates, Marina, they gave me a sense of humor, which I didn't know existed. And um, I became, I like to think, the silliest person in the, on the Enterprise. And then they have to sit you down in season six and be like, Patrick, some people are here to work. I know. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, Michael Jordan used to love saying that. It's true, Patrick. Excuse me. <laughs> I thought we were here to work. <laughs> um, now, my, my favorite bit of fun, we, and it's right, we used to, when we rehearsed, we wouldn't rehearse the scene that we were supposed to film. We would make up a dialogue, like the dialogue you described. But my favorite moment would always be when there was any peril, which was pretty much <laughs> every 15 minutes. Um, you know, something scary happened. I would leap into Jonathan Drake's arms and, and scream, we're all gonna die! <laughs> Southeast London, where I live, and my, my cell phone rang, and I answered it, and the voice said, uh, Hi, this is Ricky Gervais. And I went, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I have a good friend who does impersonations of everybody, uh, an actor called John Light, brilliant impersonations. And uh, I thought it was John fooling around with me. And he said, uh, No, 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 it's, it's, it's Ricky. And then he said, Listen, I'm doing this show, and I've got this idea, and uh, how good would you like to do it? I haven't got a script, but you know. So, uh, <laughs> So he wrote every single word in that seat is scripted. And there was not a word improvised. It was all scripted and acted, you know. How was it to, what, what, was, the, what was the tone on that set? <laughs> well, again, I was scared, because I'd never done a comedy like that before. But I watched Ricky's show, The Office, and I got the style that, that completely serious. Uh, side of all of the views, and I thought that's maybe the way I should go with this. And uh, I thought the script was brilliantly funny. And, and uh, the problem was Ricky, because he laughs all the time. <laughs> <laughs> the it is a loud, bellowy laugh. It is, yeah, yeah. He's impossible. Uh, and uh, everything, every time I open my mouth, he just shrieks with laughter. And <laughs> Steve Merchant, his, his partner, producer and writing partner, made him leave the set. Um, we did some of my close ups without Ricky there. Really? Mm. Did you fall asleep? Uh, <laughs> only once. <laughs> I also, just as a side note, just kind of nerding out a little bit, I loved you in LA Story too. I thought that was such a great. You guys, and some of the kids maybe didn't see LA Story, but it's an awesome movie. I want the fish, you kind of have the fish. Just to remind you of what you said in that movie, uh, in the camp for a second. You think with a bank now, it's like yours, you can have the duck? <laughs> You can have a piece of bread and a salad. <laughs> That's so awesome! <laughs> I can't even, I mean, it's like, I can't. I'm glad I wore a diaper. That's all. <laughs> American Man, yeah, yeah, so we were working on stuff in front. Yep. I, I, I recorded six new episodes last week in L.A. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, only, I, there was one big Bullock episode, but a lot of little bits and pieces, you know. Uh, there's a, uh, Sam has a birthday that everybody goes to, and uh, things kind of get out of hand. And, uh, <laughs> well, 
Sure. I mean, you know, when you're when you're deciding theater, and like, what what career did you envision that you were gonna have? Did you did you ever think like someday I'll go into television, or are you like, no, I'm just gonna be a theater guy? What, what do you think? No, I, I just wanted to be on stage, and uh, I spent quite a few years just working in regional theater at Provincial Rep, and uh, when I mean, I don't know how much this corresponds with your experience, Dan, but um, when I left drama school, it seemed to me every other student in my year had got an agent or a job or a manager or something. And I had nothing and I went over to my parents' house and I signed on the dole, unemployment. Mm -hmm. And I literally thought my career was over before it had begun. Because nobody was interested in employing me, they, nobody wanted after the school shows, I was, you know, it was awful. And, um, and then out of the blue, about, after about three weeks I got a phone call offering me a job as a, an assistant stage manager. Uh, an occasional acting role in a weekly rep where we did a new play every Monday night, which was, um, in a way, just what I needed, really, something like that. What happened? Yeah, right. No, I'm not, I'm not asking what's happening to you now. Right? I was curious to know what happened to you. What happened at the end of your four years? Dan, Dan went to school here in the United States. Uh, well, it was Los Angeles, which. Is its whole own thing. I mean, there's no place like it at all. It, and it has its own set of rules, right? I've lived there for like 20 years. It's not a real place. <laughs> <laughs> and and they have a really odd way of doing things. And uh, it's it's kind of weird. I was the big thing in LA. I mean, you guys know this too. The big thing in LA is they don't really know what to do with you unless you're typecast. You know, if you're a thing. I, oh yeah, you're that guy. You do this. So the, all the auditions I did when I first came out of drama school, because I still had a little bit of hair, I was a bit geeky, I wore little round glasses. I was constantly, and you've seen this guy in endless movies. I was always the guy on the bad guy's team who was the tech guy, and he was usually at a keyboard. Sort of going I think you're looking at about two thousand of that. <laughs> But he always had the line where he'd be like, we're almost in. <laughs> and, and that was pretty much me in various different ways of going, I'm almost in. And uh, so that was that. That's, that's really good. good. <laughs> I was, I, I'd like to say I was very good at it by the time I left. Um, Are you still based on Los Angeles? No, uh, I actually just moved back to the UK where I've been living in New York for the last 14 years. Um, theater is very much still my thing, and um, uh, I, I love it. And uh, we, we do share the common, uh, the common joy of being on the stage in front of a living audience, you know, and ha having that feedback every night is, is, is nothing like it at all. So really for that, you kind of SOL well in Los Angeles. Yeah, there's no theater culture really in Los Angeles. There's a lot of pretentiousness connected by traffic. Right. <laughs> this is exactly right. And uh, that, that can get boring after a while. Uh, whereas New York and London, that's very much sort of what you do. And New York's great also because there's some great TV shows that get done there and films as well. So I enjoyed it very much. But it was sort of after 14 years, it was sort of time to come home. Have you guys done plays together? Yeah. What's the most recent? What was the last thing we did? I think it was. We did a uh, <laughs> we did a very weird play together. It was a West Yorkshire Playhouse in Leeds in the north of England. A fantastic play, but freaking nuts. I mean, it was, sorry, freaking, <laughs> freaking isn't a bad word. Well, like freaking's that. okay. I'm, I'm really sorry. <laughs> you know your son's language. I mean, so what the hell? Look at the size of it. I can't look at it. I won't get my pocket money for that. I'll be fine. Um, uh, I'm king of which. Oh, yeah. Sorry, yeah. what? What did I do? Nothing. It's fine. <laughs> we were talking about the last play we did together, I think. Yeah, we were. Uh, a fantastic play uh, by an incredible British writer called J.P. Priestley. And the play starts with a man dying. And uh, called Johnson, and that's what uh, that ship was doing. And, and it's a journey 
through to him basically moving on. And it's beautiful, and it's incredibly, uh, it's, a, it's, it's an amazing play, but it's very weird. And the middle section is sort of a purgatory hell thing set in a casino. And um, that was really odd. Um, I, I played a gorilla in that particular scene. You played a gorilla? I was a gorilla. I was a card-dealing gorilla. I was... The, the dead man... It's, I told you it was weird. The dead man has, has a sort of alter ego of, called the figure that follows him all the way through and helps him actually move on and accept that he's died and move on. And that's what I played, but he, he has all these different personas that keeps popping out at various points in the play, and one of which was a card-dealing gorilla. I want this car for this price. No, poop hits you in the face. Like, I don't know how to... I want to, just because we, I want to save a few minutes for audience questions. So if you have some questions, line up the microphone and we have a few minutes uh, to ask a couple audience questions. Um, oh, hi. Oh. Oh. One at a time. One at a time. Here we go. No, we'll never get to all the questions. No, but, but we can at least, we can at least get a few. Um, obviously, uh, your experience as uh, Dr. Charles Xavier. Like, how is that... Uh, how did, how did that sort of come to fruition, and, and how has that experience been for you? Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm sorry about this, but I, I'm, I'm not a comic book fan. I, I don't really know anything about comic books at all. And i had done a film for the director, Richard Donner, um, and, uh, uh, called Conspiracy Theory, with uh, 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 Mel Gibson and uh, Julia... Um, Roberts. Roberts. <laughs> I, I've had to erase it because I am the man who hit Julia Roberts across the face and knocked her across the room, for which America has never forgiven me. <laughs> 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 no, uh, she was fabulous. Fabulous. Wonderful to work with. And um, so I got a call. I was doing ADR at Warner Brothers, and I got a note saying, would I go to the Donner's office and and uh, asked for Lauren Shula Donner, who is uh, Dick's wife and producing partner. And I found the office, and I knocked on the door, and she said, come in, and I opened the door, and she picked something up off the table and held, just held it up, like this. And I went across the other room, and I said, what am I doing on the front of a comic book? <laughs> and she said, exactly. <laughs> I have to say, though, at this point, a, a little dose of reality is I, I sort of feel that I should get some credit for him doing it at all, because there was this conversation with myself and my stepmom and my dad where it went something like this. I'm not doing that. <laughs> comic books? I don't do comic books. <laughs> Rubbish. <laughs> to which we said something like, you're nuts. <laughs> That's crazy. Do it. No, I didn't, and I had lunch with Brian Singer, uh, the director, and uh, and I admired him as a director immensely. I've seen all of his work, and, uh, but I said, look, I, I already have one albatross around my neck, and it's called John Luc Picard. I don't want to have a second one. You know, because there is, you know, there is a sort of career downside, and, and I would change nothing in my life, nothing. But, um, you know, I have had, I've sat in a movie director's office and he said to me, you're a terrific actor, I really admire you. You'd be great for this role, but why would I want John Luke Picard in my movie? Oh, someone said that to your face? Yeah. <laughs> you're at night now, you should run him through with a broadsword. <laughs> And, and Brian Singer talked me into it. Let's take a couple of audience questions really quickly before we wrap the panel. Uh, what is your name, ma'am? My name is Stephanie. Hi. What's your question? Um, in regards to prolific work with classic literature, such as Shakespeare and Moby Dick, what truths or aspects have you learned about yourself by performing roles that have stood the test of time? Wow. <laughs> um, I think the uh, I think you've uh, gone over the excessive. 
extensive baggage uh, <laughs> for the weight of that question. She wants to know, through all of the work that you've done, essentially, what truths, uh, what have you learned about yourself uh, through your craft? I think was ultimately. Uh, well, one most important thing, which happened in only about 20 years ago, I've been an actor for 52 years now, was um, to not to be afraid. Because I was fearful for years and years and years. We, Dan and I have talked a lot about this. Um, I was afraid of being myself. I was a great faker, but then a lot of English actors are. We fake brilliantly. Um, and then a, a series of things happened, jobs, directors I worked with, and I found that I could stop faking it and the sky didn't fall off my head. So getting rid of fear, and that's what I say to all acting students when I talk to them, it's the most important thing they have to free themselves of because they are not expressing themselves when they are afraid of being themselves. So I've learned that. And um, as for all those roles you mentioned, uh, what I learned 20, 25 years ago was that all of these people already exist inside me. It doesn't matter how unspeakable they are, how unpleasant. They are there, and you have to find all those elements internally. Do you think coming to grips with the fear was something that uh, you just gained from, uh, you know, as, as you aged, or do you, was, it, was it because of your work? No, it was just good, happy coincidence that I, I worked with two directors almost back to back who were saying to me the same thing. I mean, one of them I worked with who actually said to me, this was at the Young Vic in London in, a, in an American play, he said to me, stop, 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 stop. This is not the Royal Shakespeare Company. You can't bring those bad habits here. Oh. 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 Snap. Uh, <laughs> do you feel like you're, okay, good, excellent. Ne next question. Hello. Hello, I'm Jim Marsh, and my question is, if you were given the opportunity to be a theater, and the two roles to be filled were Lear and Kent, and if you were going to be filling these in the camera, which would you choose? Did you catch that? Yeah, I did. Um, what do you think? Well, I think I don't want to play you. Well, I, I mean, the fact is, I'm probably too old to play Kent now. I thought you, if you said Lear or Gloucester, it might make sense because uh, my best friend, who is an actor in England, um, uh, is two years older than me and he is about to play Gloucester. Uh, in fact, in the same theatre where we did John Snow over Jordan in Leeds. Uh, Gloucester is a great role, Kent is a magnificent role. Uh, I've been in the play once and I played the Duke of Cornwall. The great thing about the Duke of Cornwall is that he gets killed before the interval and you get to go home. <laughs> <laughs> you remember I used to come home like nine o'clock at night instead of quarter to midnight. That actually is a rule too. If you die before the interval, you get to go home. You know, you understand. Yeah, it is. You'll never see actors who die before the interval take the curtain off. Um, you know, it's like there are all these kind of you know, rules and choices that you would never know about. For instance, there's a character of Prior Lawrence in Romeo and Juliet who always wears a long friar's robe down to his ankles. Um, and uh, 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 I'm just trying to think what the choice is about that. Um, uh, I'm oh no, it's a choice of, uh, if you want to play Prior Lawrence or Mercutio, you get the choice of playing Mercutio and getting to go home before the interval or play Friar Lawrence and keeping your trousers on. <laughs> That's sometimes all it comes down to. <laughs> all right, good, thank you. Thank you. Next question. All right, well, I just want to ask about uh, what do you like, which, which role do you like better, Masterminds or the Page Master? <laughs> well, uh, Page Master, as I recall, was an animated movie. Um, no, that was live action, what do you mean? I mean, what? I'm kidding. <laughs> Why are you screwing with Patrick Stewart? Do you know how you would get ripped apart by all these people, like like the friggin' Walking Dead? I enjoy. Well, I said, as I think I said, Page Master was an animated movie, so I was just a voice in that. But 
uh, masterminds, not only was I in, but I co-produced that movie as well. And we really, the writer and the director and myself, thought that we were making the next Home Alone. I thought we were going to be zillionaires. <laughs> and it opened in LA on Friday night and closed Sunday. <laughs> well, it makes you feel any better. I like that as a child. You will redeem yourself now, sit down. A couple more questions. Yes, what is your name, sir? Steve. Hey, Steve, what's your question? Uh, well, you did buy this earlier, but uh, I'd like to say congratulations on your long overdue knighthood. Uh, is this a big deal to you? And uh, how, how, how does that process even work? And secondly, why is your son so much taller than you? <laughs> Those are all weird but fair questions. <laughs> I think Dan should answer the last question. I don't think that's true at all. I think if anyone should be answering that question, it should be you. <laughs> well, uh, I wasn't there at the time. <laughs> um, but the thing is, I had a very deprived childhood. Uh, we had nothing to eat. Uh, we had very little fresh air to breathe. And uh, so I grew up stunted. Uh, Daniel, on the other hand, had... Uh, Parents who fed him well, and he had exercise and clean fresh air in Warwickshire, and um, you know, and I used to hit him every time he slumped over. <laughs> um, but I didn't catch the first question. Well, the first question was about being knighted. Like, what was the process like? And, and I, oh, his first oh. hilarious question was, "Is it a big deal to you?" <laughs> oh, you know to be knighted? Yeah, I don't know, whatever. Thanks, <laughs> um, well, Liz. <laughs> I, I think his exact words were at the time when the Queen lowered the sword when she said, I make you a knight of the British realm. He said, uh, What? <laughs> That's cool, man. That's all right. Um, first of all, I, I forgive me, but I don't agree with you, sir. I thought the timing of it was. Perfect. If it had happened any sooner, I would have felt like a fraud. I really do think it was perfect. And others have said what you said, but uh, that, that's, for me, not accurate. Um, yes, it's a great, great honor and distinction, and I'm really proud of it. And I know some actors have turned them down. Uh, I know one who turned uh, a knighthood down three times. Um, oh, I can't say. Steve, it was Steve Gutenberg. <laughs> yeah, weirdly. I don't know why you didn't want him. Because he was from England. You're funny. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I can die now! I know that was the greatest thing I've ever heard in my life! That was awesome. Oh my God. Yeah, I mean, I did one of those Q&A things in one of the Sunday papers recently. You know, the same, they ask people the same set of questions. And, and one of the questions is, how would you like to be remembered? And people give that very serious, you know, solemn answers. And I said, for being funny, but it's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> because, I, I mean, Laurence Olivier said, um, there is far more satisfaction to be got out of making an audience laugh than making them weep. And I increasingly, as I get older, come to feel that is true. I love to hear the sound of a live audience laughing, which you, of course, are very familiar with. Uh, well, sometimes, but not all the time. <laughs> uh, thank you. Is your question sufficiently? Okay, great. Uh, we think this probably has to be. This is the last question. Yes, sir. What is what is your question? Oh, this better be good. <laughs> the pressure's on now. Man. Actually, it's nothing near as funny. Uh, um, what do you mean they brought them in the nights? What was it like working with personalities like Bill Brooks and Terry Owens? Yes, what was it like working with Mel Brooks for Robin Hood Men and Tights? Uh, uh, I, was only, I did about six days work on that, and I simply remember starting laughing at about six o'clock in the morning and, and not stopping until they called us a wrap at the end of the day. Um, I, I mean, it wasn't just Mel, but there were some very funny people in that movie. And um, I don't know how the movie get, I don't know how his movies get made. <laughs> because, you know, um, and, and there's, 
you know, yeah, unlike uh, Ricky, where it's all scripted, uh, he improvises and loves to improvise. And I'm happy to say that I have one moment on film where I improvise something that actually made Mel Brooks laugh. Um, uh, the, with the line was something like, uh, uh, well, it was, it was Dan's line just now. I had to say to Mel, who was playing uh, Friar Tuckman, um, uh, who uh, practiced uh, Greece in a little tent to one side, um, uh, I said to him, uh, thank you, Father, and he said, Rabbi, and that was the line, that was all it was. And I said, thank you, Father, and he said, Rabbi, and I said, whatever. <laughs> located at 23681 Via Linda, Suite 8, in Mission Viejo, California, 92691. Call them at 949-830-7267. Cardio boxing, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, Mai Tai, regular boxing, yoga, or women's classes only. Rampage Fitness Academy has it all. Check them out at rampagefitnessacademy.com.